All right. <coughs> okay, now <coughs> I had this problem before. Yeah, okay, that's better. So <clears throat> I was at this conference uh, on Java 1, which has been running now for 20 years, and that's where one learns what's new in Java, um, or what's fairly recent in Java anyway. So one of the presenters gave this, this nice talk about Java puzzlers. And so they have been going on for years, um, uh, like 15 years ago, so um, two fellows started that and they, every year they would give these puzzles and then they wrote a very nice book about that that really everyone who thinks that they know Java should be getting. Uh, it's called Java Puzzlers. And so it has all sorts of interesting snippets of Java code and you read through it and you think you know Java and it turns out that you don't. And so then they, they explain you know, what it is that you were missing and so on. So I will be doing a, uh, a couple of these and so to, to gauge general knowledge and attendance, I'm going to do this on Piazza. So let me put in this clicker question. Well, you guys can read this on your own screen while I'm messing here with Piazza. Uh, Yes, I'm a professor, you idiots. Where do I log in? Yeah. Or to get to the lecture page, you go to the general course page and then to today's lecture slides. Uh, maybe you need to refresh because I only put it up like 20 minutes ago. Okay, let's make a clicker question here. All right, so the question should be coming up. So, so you've read about these things in the book, um, I hope. <coughs> We're having here the comparer interface. Um, I'm having a class of, of some class that contains the static method, some alpha class. Um, it takes an array of strings. It takes the comparator. And now it figures out by using comp the comparator, which one of these is the largest one. Um, now actually, it doesn't do that. No, it doesn't, it doesn't. So uh, it says, you know, at the beginning, we'll just take the first one as the result, and then when we have a result, and we check, is it less than value i? And if that is so, then we say, well, we found a bigger one, and then we remember that bigger one. And so the advantage of the comparator was we can measure, in this case, strings, any way we want. We don't have to just compare them lexicographically. We can measure them by whatever criterion we like to measure them. That's the whole point of using uh, the comparator here. So, here we have a, an array of strings. 
and you think about why I had to change the lamb into a zebra. Um, and so we are passing that on, and then this comparator here, we're defining as a lambda expression like this. So obviously, you know, we're comparing the strings by length. So, I would like to know from you in the next two minutes whether this thing returns these th uh, one of these three alternatives, or if you have genuinely no idea, no shame in admitting so, I would like to know, because I want to know to what detail do I need to go back to you know, what, what you were reading, or what I assigned you for reading. So ponder that. And this, uh, this, by the way, is a question that I took from one of the puzzlers and just changed it a little bit to, uh, just to match our lectures. And I would say about a third of the room had no idea. And those were professional Java programmers. Of the other two thirds, 90% got it wrong. Good luck. Huh? The what? Oh, it's the pull. It should be. Let me let me look on my side here with the with the app. I'm still waiting for eight more votes. Five more votes. Three more votes. Two 
more. One more. Twenty-one is twenty-two people in class. We're still only getting twenty-one votes. Okay, let's put the very last person. Put us out of our misery. Apparently not. Alright. <coughs> so so now the interesting thing here is that compared to that, that conference session that I was in, there's a much larger percentage of people who think that they know what they're doing, but unfortunately not a larger percentage of people who got the right answer. So hold this thought, because I was figuring this, this might happen, and I want to ask one more question before we before we go on. Um, that's this one here, so just go to the slides and advance by one. So here's the same, same question, but you notice that, you know, we're passing in a null where, you know, over here we had an honest-to-goodness lambda expression. So I want to know how it behaves in that case. Yeah, feel free to ask your neighbor if you want to hint. Waiting for another 10, no, nine responses. Eight responses. Six. Four. Three. 
All right, so now I have 22 responses, and here they are. So, <clears throat> so the correct answer is ni neither the most nor the least popular one. Um, so one of the reasons that, that, uh, that we do these these in-class clicker questions, as absurd as it may be to waste class time with it, is they give valuable information to, to me and to you. And in almost all cases, what valuable information do they give you? Huh? Uh, that you don't know, that don't know as much as you think you do. That is usually what happens. So um, some of you may have used that, that code check program. That, that I've written that if we use in 46A and 46B to rapidly grade lots and lots of small submissions. And the principal purpose of code check is to show to the instructors that the students don't know how to code. The instructors don't know that. Um, so generally when you take a class with someone, uh, the instructors generally have this idea that the students know most of the things that are going on because the fellows in the front row, no matter what, what I say, they will nod sagely and smile. Uh, and so this gives you really an idea of what goes on. So, and I know this because this whole thing with the interfaces is abstract and it's complicated, and uh, it is genuinely difficult to to grasp it. And it's unfortunate that that's when I was out of town, so that I couldn't even try to explain this better in class. But uh, what we're going to do is going to go through a couple of the key things and do some weird role playing. So that's. Let me pull up the slides that I need for that. Um, we're going to come back to that. And in fact, I'm going to give you a recipe on how to find out what the correct answers are so that it's not just mere guess. So somehow, um, this one is not updated because I'm slides for four. All right, so, so in the book, it started out with, as a motivating example for dealing with, uh, with interfaces. It started out with this icon interface, right? And so where do we have the icon interface? Here it is. So icon is an interface, has three methods. And so let me do the following. Let me write a little bit of... Uh, utility code that works with icons. So I'll have some class gallery. And I'll have a method draw that draws a bunch of icons. So I'm giving the component, the graphics, whatever they are, we can get the x, and as y as I can do. That's a popular form. And then I say x equals x plus icon i, get icon. Okay, so now we need two volunteers. 
years. So, so the volunteers should stand like stand here. So you each have your marker. So one of you will be the Mars icon. That will be the family Mars icon over here, and you will be an image icon. Okay. So both of you will be in this array of icons. I will be the gallery. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I'm going to ask you, first you, then you, because you're zero and you're number one. I'm going to ask you to, to paint yourself, do the best, your best to paint something. And then I'm going to ask you something else. So I'm going to ask icon zero, paint yourself. At position zero, zero. Paint something, like paint the globe.
it going to do with all the icons? Right now I just have two. But imagine I have 20. Exactly, right? It's going to just make a little gallery, putting them one after another, a little strip of the icons. We don't know what the icons are, but it's pretty useful, right? A few lines of code, and you can do something that's genuinely useful. So that is the whole point of using interfaces, that it allows someone to do useful stuff without knowing very much about how the internals are done. It's a key idea. It's a complicated idea because normally when people learn about interfaces, they think of, they think about it the wrong way, and they think about it the wrong way because it's always, what if they're the wrong way? So normally when someone you know, writes something about interfaces, like in a book or something, the first thing they do is they say, here is the interface. That's not the important part. That's the technical minimal part. This is the important part. The important part is the services that you can do with the interface. An interface is nothing without useful services. So when people come up with an interface, they always come the other way around. They have something that they want to do something that actually is interesting and useful, like arranging a bunch of icons horizontally and vertically. And then they say, well, what is the interface that we need to get that done? And so it's always useful when you see an interface to ask, where does it come from? Why is it there? What, what can one actually do with it? All right. So, So there was this picture here in the book, and we can of course draw a similar picture here with the gallery. So let's have our next one here. Put the gallery in there. So here's the, the gallery, and it uses the icon interface. It uses the icon interface because there's the word icon over here. We have an icon object. We call it icon interface. Does it know anything about Mars icon or about image icon? It does not, right? And so that is one thing that interfaces are uh, good for: that you separate concerns. The gallery only knows about this part here, and it doesn't have to know. More so that's considered uh, a good thing. Okay. Polymorphism, we went through that. All right, on to comparable. So the comparable interface has a single method, namely compare to. And so compare to uh, was, of course, uh, compare was written so that one can do things like, okay, what services can you do with, with compare? Well, sorting, right? That, that way you can sort arbitrary stuff. Now sorting, you know, it takes a couple of loops or, or some ingenuity, so I don't want to do sorting. I'll just go back to the, to the largest thing that I had on, on the board before. So, you know, it's not too scary if I write it in the generic way. Okay, but 
this case, I do need to know that T is the same. So I'm going to compute the largest of an array of comparable values. And the code was like this. It said that T is almost zero. This critical spot, the code is a little different because that's comparable. So it's values that compare to, uh, I'm sorry, large result of values some objects that implement comparable. See what we got here? Countries. Countries are great. So, so I don't want to compare to her yet. I want to just compare a ball. And let's see how countries compare themselves. So over here, country knows how to compare itself against another country by checking the area. Okay. So looking for two volunteers. Uh, if you enjoy volunteers, I hope one of you can do that. <laughs> So you return to the greater zero. So uh, the United States says, when I compare myself to Luxembourg, I'm bigger. Okay. Um, do we get to ask Luxembourg about anything? No, because we're done at the end of the array, and we have found the larger of the two countries. Now, what, what I want everyone to observe is this. The algorithm had no idea how to do this part, right? I just asked him and said, hey, you compare yourself against the next country. And he did know how to compare himself against another country. So in this case, the responsibility of comparing yourself against another country is with the country object. Okay, thank you, country object. Okay, so, so this in a nutshell is how comparable works. The, the objects that are sitting in the array, each of them know how to compare themselves against other country objects. The United States, he knew when asked, hey, how do you compare yourself with and that's fine, um, but what's the drawback of, of, of using the comparable interface? It's a very commonly implemented interface. You know, string, for example, run comparable integer, file, path, probably all these classes. 
It only works one way. Let's say, for example, string. String implements compare. So I have a, a I have some list of strings. Like this, and now I want to have it sorted. And I call collections.sort and this array. What's collections.sort going to do? Which one's going to put, put first? I would think America, right? Because collections.sort uses just sorts by the Unicode values. An uppercase A is much less than a lowercase A. It's in fact going to do America, Amy, Zulu, and then Abel. No one in their right mind would sort like that. In fact, there's no good reason ever to use that string sorting, except if you don't care about what the sort order is. If you just want some ordering, but you don't actually care what it is. Now, that's, now that's not as, uh, as uncommon as you might think. If you put a bunch of strings in a tree set, for example, you need some ordering. You need a total ordering, but you don't really care what it is, as long as there's one that's efficiently computed. So, um, <clears throat> but that means that you don't really normally use that. You're much more likely to use the comparators. And so, let's go to that. So now I'm gonna munch this thing here to instead of having T require that something is comparable. <coughs> Make it work for any T and pass a comparator. Oh, and that has to be comparator on T. As another parameter. And over here, I now call the comparator and pass them both. So let's quickly play through this. So who is the back one? Well, here we have a two of you and a three. <coughs> so you'll be the comparator, and you will compare countries by name, not by size, but by name. We'll pick two countries with different names. You'll be worldwide. You'll be worldwide. Uh, you, you're you're going to be country. Oh, you're, you're just like worldwide. Oh, okay. okay. Be a different country. What country do you want? Oh, I have no okay. 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 Exactly. Yes. What country do you want? Oh, you'll be the Czech Republic. <laughs> All right. So, if, if you're going to be the comparator, he's the Czech Republic. You know how to write the Czech Republic? Can you pick up the German? You know the German. Ah, okay. Okay, you'll be German and you'll be German. Okay, so if you will, you know how to compare countries by name? By the, by the first letter, right? Uh, this is not the better word. So you're going to have to compare countries in the better word. You're going to be given two countries. When you give two countries, you're going to have to your name. And then you have two strings. And then you compare those two strings and pass them back. Do you know what to return? Okay, good. Alright, so now I will go along here. So I is zero. Okay, so that means that okay, it's obvious right now that it's Uruguay. Now I'm back in the loop with I equals one. Now I have to execute this thing. So I'm going to ask you. Compare this country and that country. No, no, you go, you have to ask them something. Let's say, what's your name? Okay. Yeah, and what are you going to return to me? Why, Uruguay is. I don't want to. <laughs> 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 
by Captain Sun. that when you have a problem of understanding or following along what these objects do, it really is a good question, uh, it's, it's a good strategy to personify the object. People do that all the time. And so when you want to figure out something like a puzzle, like that we had here, All right, so <clears throat> so it's really basically the same algorithm, right? Um, see the comp compare here. The only difference is here I didn't confuse anyone with the generic form, but I just put it right here. Um, and by the way, you don't yet have to know how to write these generic things. We're going to come to that later in the, uh, in the course. But I hope it's when you read it. So, now let's see, who wants to be the comparator? Uh, you'll be the comparator. Yes. Okay, so, um, you probably don't need it. So, so I'm going to be running the algorithm, and so I'm going to be asking you questions. So I'm going to say, hey comparator, I need to compare Mary and Tad. What are you returning to me? Nothing. Four. And he returns four. Okay, why does he return four? Because Mary's length is four. And Tad's length is three. So he returns to me four. Okay. Is four less than zero? No. Rhetorical question. So I don't change my mind about the result. So what is, Mr. Comparator, what, what do you get when comparing had and hate? Huh? I'm asking you. Oh, I see. But uh, you're right. I shouldn't do that. I should ask you to compare Mary and Hayes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Correcting me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so you can be a Mary and Hayes, and what do you get? You get four. Okay, so I'm not getting into the negative branch. The result is still Mary. Okay, Mary and Little. Okay. 
uh, six is still not less than zero. In fact, can this ever be less than zero? No, why not? Because the comparator here is not really very good. Thank you. <laughs> See, it, it has mass but max here, so it never returns whether one string is longer than the other in any meaningful way, right? It doesn't, like the one that we had in the, in the flow, it took the difference of the lengths, the length from character. That way, if one string was shorter than the other, the difference was a negative number. If one string was longer than the other, the difference was a positive number. Taking the max makes no sense for a comparator. Okay. So what's the right answer? So the right answer here is Mary, because it never changes and so you can pat themselves on the back. So there were three users who can pat themselves on the back. Do I get to see who they are? I don't think so. Oh, what a shame. All right, so I never know. Um, but where were those three are? <coughs> Um, if it wasn't by dumb luck, but by skill, then that was good. Um, and so that was a good puzzle question, of course, because when people look at it in, in, in a conference where they kind of know what they're doing, they, they look at the big picture. They don't necessarily look at every last thing. And so a good part of the audience you know, never noticed that there was a max here, or if they did, they say, well, we need to compute the largest, and it didn't somehow uh, surprise them. Um, but if you actually execute a step at a time, you see what's the thing. All right, so now let's settle the second part of the puzzle. The second part of the puzzle was, what if you call the same thing, but you only had one of them, and you had a null in And I must confess, when I first saw that, I thought it doesn't compile. I thought you can't have null as a lambda expression. But then I realized that they were, wait a minute. What does this function here, what does this method here expect? There's nothing that says it can expect the lambda expression, right? This thing doesn't say, give me a lambda expression. And in fact, that is weird about lambda expressions in Java. You can never say, give me a lambda expression. Lambda expressions do not exist as types that programmers can define. There's only one thing that you can do with a lambda expression. What is the one thing you can do with a lambda They've been purposefully designed so that there's nothing else that you can do. So yeah, I have a lambda expression, the original one, forget the null for a minute again. This lambda expression here was, was assigned top to a variable whose type is an error phase. That is the one and only thing that you can do with a lambda expression. You can assign it to a variable whose type is a functional interface, an interface with just one abstract method. So <clears throat> this thing here was assigned to top, whatever. If this thing here is null, it's perfectly okay to call this thing here with top equal. It's not a syntax error. It may not be smart, but it's not a syntax error. Yeah, there are lots of things that are not smart. So it's perfectly okay to say comp equals null. Then let's see what happens. So result is null. I is zero. So we're at this branch, I is zero. Does this call to comp here happen? No, because of the, the or will, as soon as one of the conditions of the or is true, 
until you have this more deeply evaluated. And so what the short circuit evaluation will be like. So pump is not evaluated. That is just as well. Because if pump had been evaluated, what would happen? Then you would get a null pointer exception. So no null pointer exception. Result is married. <coughs> now i is one, but that's greater than the value of length. So for example, it's returned as married. So there's no exception because this thing was just happened to be that the, the call the pump was never triggered when the array had length one. There was nothing to compare when the array had length one. So that's the right answer. And uh, let's see. how people are doing, and so the right answer was answer number, I don't remember, was answer number four? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so a third of the users got that right, and a good number of people thought it was a null pointer exception, and I'm imagining that those people who thought it was a null pointer exception did not get that answer by tracing through the code. But by kind of vaguely saying, no, no, pointer exception sounds good. Uh, is that a fair statement? Or maybe you trace through the code wrong. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's always a possibility. So, but it is important to be able to, to, to trace through these things. Now, there was a question on the homework, how to deal with these sequences. Oh, this is misaligned here. Iterate, iterate here. Yeah, filter. So we're starting with one sequence. case the square sequence and then we're filtering it according to a predicate and so filter needs to return yeah, what does it need to return it needs to return an object I guess of what class ah, okay very interesting so uh, so I said what does filter need to return and the unanimous answer was square sequence Certainly not, because let's try to understand what a square sequence it does. Um, how about you? You are a square sequence. Has next. Now I'm asking you, the gentleman. Yes, you. Has next. No, no. Has next. Next. Okay, who, who knew? You knew. Okay, we'll, we'll try with you. Okay, so so next. Has next. No, it has next. It has next is the Boolean, right? Okay, so has next is true. Okay, next. Has next. Has next. <laughs> true, yeah. Uh, and call, calling has next twice in a row really doesn't have a good effect, right? It gives you the same answer. Again, so calling has next more than once is the same as just calling once. Okay, but next was four. Next. Next. Okay, good. So you know how to be a square sequence. Now, the result of this one here cannot be a square sequence because when one asks is next, 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 it gets different answers from a square sequence. All square sequences, square sequences by the way, are the same. Right? Let's try that. You, be a square sequence. 
Next. Zero. <laughs> No, no, we start at zero. When the first call, the next gives zero. I'm pretty sure. Really? Square signal starts with one? No. Um, I am pretty sure it started with zero because they're here. Okay, let's try this again. So I'll, I'll construct you a new. Next. Okay, you're just freshly constructed. Next. Zero. Next. Zero. Next. Zero. Next. Zero. Yeah. Notice that all square sequence, if I construct another one, they all act the same way. Okay. Okay. Every square sequence in, out there will say, when called next, 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 will say 0, 1, 4, 9, 16, 25. You know, maybe one could have done a, a smarter class, like an nth power sequence or something, but we didn't. So all square sequences are the same. Now, where's the thing with filter? So here we have a square sequence, and now we ask the square sequence to filter itself. And the question was, and remains, you know, what does it return? It returns an object, an object of some class, and someone said that class is square sequence. But that can't be, because when we ask whatever this object is, okay, let's give it a name other than what's right, right here. So, so we have a square sequence that filter, and it's an object. Give it a name. How about Fred? Fred is always a good name because there's no, it's not judgmental, right? You don't really know what Fred does, so you have to think about it. All right, now I'm going to ask Fred next. And that's what we're going to play right now. Who always wanted to be Fred? You were the crack press sequence. <laughs> okay. So, okay. so now I'm going to ask Fred next. So now what are you what do you have to do to answer next? Exactly. What are you gonna ask? The, the trick is you have to be careful in this example here that there's a filter that you also know the, the filter is well maybe we, maybe since you don't know what the filter is we need someone to play the filter um, you look like you always enjoyed being a filter okay stand there because <coughs> that, that actually doesn't make it more so so you have afraid that's just gotten the zero now ask the filter what he thinks of zero no, no, you have to say. Okay, that's correct. Okay, because the filter checks whether something is odd, and so you have my zero. Now what do you do? Yeah, go ahead. Now you, I'm still holding the answer. So now I just know that the answer was one. And that was entirely correct, okay? <coughs> so see what she was doing. She was asking the original sequence for the next. Then she was passing the result to the filter. The filter disliked it or liked it. Eventually the filter liked it and I got it back. That's how you implement it. That is exactly how you implement it, okay? So that means what, what Fred needs to know is two things. She needs to know the original sequence and she needs to know the filter. Those will be instance variables of Fred. Okay? Questions about this? Yes? Yeah. What do you do when you get to the end? Okay, all right. 
so, so, so I, uh, I lied a little bit in saying it's really easy, right? What I said is, you know, Fred just asks the sequence, next, 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 and eventually the filter approves and the answer comes up. And that would work except what if there is no next? And in that case, of course, it would be nice if she could have just said, you know, um, there is no next, but that's not a valid answer, right? So what it really means is you're going to have to think, how are you going to implement has next? Because uh, what what she can do, so let's let's try this out. You're not a square sequence anyway. You're just a sequence of the numbers one through three. Okay, and so let's try this. I'll say next. So you're going to ask him. You say, ah! <laughs> so at this point, you throw an exception, right? Okay, what do you do? No, no, she, you already said that. He threw an exception. Now what do you do? Oh, you can throw an exception. That's perfectly fine, because the precondition of next is that has next is true. Okay, it's not fair for me to ask for next if has next is false. In that case, I deserve what I get. And if you throw a tantrum, that's life. So that really means that it's a little bit trickier, and you have to figure out how to deal with has next. So, and the problem with has next is that has next gets dangerously close to consuming the next value. That's always true with these iteration things, and that's something that I do want you to figure out. So do the simple case first. So that you get a feel for it. And then go back and ask yourself, how does that dialogue have to work when you, you know, just in real life, you can't just ask next without first asking, is it okay if we next? Right? So you'll figure it out. I mean, it, uh, it requires a little bit of extra protocol, and there's a couple of different ways of doing it. But I think if you think of that, you know, these three entities are real people, and think of the dialogue in between them, that's a good way of doing it. All right, thank you. So now that you've seen this dialogue in for real, maybe it makes the sequence diagrams a little bit more real. Does anyone know what the name of this is? Yes. How do you know? <laughs> okay, so you looked up the Java doc for predicate, and there it said that the collection of two levels is the same. Oh, here it is. Yeah, that's a lot of predicates. Yeah, Java util function. Uh, there's more than one method. What 
what's that? Oh, excellent. Yes, there's only one abstract method, right? This one here is the abstract method. Why does it say abstract? So, historically, remember, all methods in an interface were abstract. And then abstract method one is that's not default or static. Okay, so we don't have to say abstract. They don't say abstract so as not to contribute to the global picture for you. Yeah, so this is the, the one abstract method here. These ones here are default and static. Yeah. So, uh, do, any, do these do anything interesting? Um, they do actually. Um, dot negate will take a predicate and turn it into its opposite and use and and or to, to make an and and or predicate. I must say I've never used them, but I guess you could. Is equal is, is somewhat useful. Um, Let's say I have a list of names. <coughs> Let's say it's a list of strings, friends, say. <coughs> then I can call friends remove all. There's a shortcut to lambda expression, these, these method expressions, um, that you can say, I want to return everything that's equal to friends. And then you can write it like this. So that's a weird use case that, uh, that explains why they stuck that static method in. All right, so. Okay, now I erase the sequence diagram. Um, so imagine how the sequence diagram was. You can still see the outlines of it. So the sequence diagram, if you think about it, it captures, it captures kind of the same thing as the three people who were standing here and who were talking to each other, except that it leaves a record of them. And so I know from experience, when people first draw sequence diagrams, they think it's a stupid exercise. Because you know, it's boring with, it, with simple cases. But when you have these more complicated cases, it can be a good idea do that. So I, uh, if you get baffled by what you're trying to do, you, know, you might say that's a good time to do a sequence diagram. All right, other questions about the homework? Yes? No, no, no. So, um, so the linear congruential generator is just some formula on how you can get the next random number from the previous random number. It's, I just put that in there so as a general piece of trivia on how random number generators work. They really do work like that. And so it's just an application of iterate. You should be able to, to in, in a one-liner, it's trivial. I mean, it really is. You just get past the math and it's some equation for how to get the next number. And you just um, make that into a function that you pass to iterate. And that's all. Yes? What's that? Ah, okay, excellent question. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked. So uh, his question was, with filter, does one only have to implement it for square sequence or for any class? Now remember uh, when Fred was playing something. Was Fred an object of a class?
I, I guess she was, um, in, in a way. So from there, the, because you can see that she was, because it's not a static method, right? Filter is called on an instance. So in that regard, the implementation wasn't quite fair. But uh, really, the answer is that this should be a default method of number sequence. So filter should definitely be a default method of number sequence so that it works for any method. Oh. It's a long predicate, right? And that way, That way you can apply it like you did here on a square sequence, or you can apply it to any other sequence. You know, for example, if I like, I could pop dot filter one more time. So I can apply it to any sequence that I want. to return an object of some class. Of what class? And that's the class that Fred was an instance of. Number sequence is not a class. Number sequence is an interval. No, because square sequence is a pretty dumb sequence. No offense to square sequence here, right? Square sequence can just say one, four, nine, sixteen. Zero, one, four, nine. Yes. So it's it's the it's the class that we store the numbers. No, you don't store the numbers in there. It's who has photographic memory and can remember what was in that first box. I have something. Number sequence. Yes, I had said filtered sequence, okay? So that is a class that you need to, to produce. And so the first play, Fred, was a filtered sequence. That's what she was. She was an instance of filtered sequence. And she demonstrated how filtered sequences operate. Right, when I asked her to do next, they would ask that other sequence, hey, next, 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 and then get that predicate to always to, to reject it until finally it's true. That's how a filtered sequence works. So you need to implement filtered sequence. You need to implement a next method that works kind of like what we were playing with. Now, what do I put in the constructor? What does the filtered sequence need to know to do the work? Predicate and the whatever sequence, right? How do I call the whatever sequence? Ah, uh, I can't write number sequence. Number. Which four letter word is this? Filter, and of course the real catch is how do you implement the filter sequence? So that's 
why we just did this little thing. All right, the final thing. Um, I do actually want to. Okay, let me say this like this. Those of you who don't know how to run JUnit on the command line, hang in for a couple of minutes and I demo it. If you know how to run JUnit on the command line, then you can go. All right, so let me just demo this. So here we have homework three. And so I have to figure out where my J unit is. I don't actually remember. I may not have J unit on the machine, so let me get it real quick. Oh, now we have J unit five. Oh dear. Um, download, download here. Okay, so there's two jars that I need. Now I make a directory somewhere, say on my home directory. Um, and I like to use put the version number in it. And now I take those two downloads. Um, JUnit. Where did it download it? Sure, the age old question. Oh, come on, just give me the file. Okay, where was it? It's Hamcrest. Sorry about that. Um, oh. oh, this is charming Chrome. This type of file can harm your computer. I don't know why a jar file can harm my computer or whatever. Uh, uh, all right, here we have. So now I have a directory with these two, two files in here. So now I need to want to compile something. So... Uh, let's say mutable debate day test. So if I just compile it, then it's not going to work because it doesn't know where to get like a sort equals and so on. When you do this in Eclipse, no big deal because you can just add J unit to the library, but on the command line you have to set the class path. So you set the class path and um, so I want in my J unit 412 directory, I want all files in there and so you now do a backslash and an asterisk. And then also I'm going to add the current directory to the class path. So that's important that you do this right. So the colon here means it separates two paths. The dot is the current directory. And this means all jars in this directory. You need the backslash in Linux because otherwise the store will be expanded by the shell. And now it compile fine. Now when I run it, I still need the same class path. So I'm first going to do it wrong because it's an easy mistake to make. So let me just, just run it. But that doesn't work because mutable test doesn't have a main. Mutable test, if you remember, just has a bunch of tests. So I need to have some class that has, uh, that has the main method in it that knows how to load the test case. And that class has some name that I can never remember. Does anyone remember? Um, Google does. Um, so if I had a dollar for every time that I Googled this. Um, it is JUnit 
command line, and I'm not the first one who asked the question, how to run test cases from the command line. So, and here it is. So it's org.junit.runner.junit.core. They really could have given this a better name. With better, I mean the one that I can remember. So, and then it runs the tests. It's not as pretty as the one inside Eclipse because it doesn't give you a green bar but it's good enough to run it in a script. Okay, so double check that. Um, that's that's a good thing to do, um, that, you, that you know how to do that. You don't strictly need to do it for tomorrow, but you should know how to do it. All right, I will see you on Thursday. Good luck with that one tonight.